This tutorial is all about copper and how it is purified and it's also about various alloys including smart alloys. The first thing you must be able to do is to explain the advantages and disadvantages of recycling copper. Now to understand some of these you need to think about what copper is actually used for and the main uses of copper in Britain are for making water pipes and gas pipes and for making electric cables. Copper is made into water pipes and gas pipes because it's very unreactive metal and it's quite malleable. It can be bent into shapes so that the pipes can be sent around corners. Also it's made into uh, electrical cables because it's a very very good conductor of electricity. One advantage of recycling copper is that it's a very expensive metal. The cost of scrap metal has risen recently and it's now around £3.50 per kilogram. Copper can be extracted from its ore but it's more expensive to do this and in fact the best copper ores have now been exhausted across the world. If we need to get copper from its ore this involves smelting which means heating up with carbon or coke and this requires fuel so it's still very expensive to do and once the copper has been smelted it has to be purified to make it suitable for electrical use. One disadvantage of recycling copper is that the copper may well be mixed with other metals which make it impure for example with brass fittings from for example the plumbing industry. Copper must be very pure because one of the major uses of copper is in electrical cables. Electrical cables must offer no resistance and therefore the copper must be almost 100% pure. If there is resistance in the wire caused by impurities this could cause a heating effect and the cables in your house would warm up, get very hot and could cause fires. Copper is purified by a process called electrolysis and much of this work is at higher level. You need to understand a good deal about this process and that includes the names of the electrodes and the electrolyte and what happens during the electrolysis process in terms of the transfer of electrons. This is a simplified diagram of the apparatus for the purification of copper. This is taken I think from the BBC Bite Size site which is well worth having a look at. The power supply is a DC current, that means direct current like from a battery. There are two electrodes, one of them is negatively charged by the power supply and this is called the cathode. The cathode is made out of pure copper, whereas the anode is made from a lump of impure copper which has been made by smelting. The idea of this purification is that there is also a solution which contains copper in the form of ions. Ions are charged particles and copper ions in this case have got two plus charged ions which means that they're the same as the atoms except they are lacking in two electrons. The solution which is called the electrolyte is actually copper two sulfate solution so it contains copper two plus ions and sulfate two minus ions which don't get involved in the process. The whole principle is that copper atoms will dissolve from the impure anode into solution and then the ones from solution will form onto the pure copper cathode to make it larger. Cue the terrible diagram. What we have here is an electrolysis cell filled with the electrolyte which contains copper ions we have a cathode made out of pure copper atoms and an anode made out of impure copper atoms which of course contains other atoms which aren't copper. It's all connected up to an electric supply. The cell which has got a positive terminal and a negative terminal starts to pump electrons around the circuit so that the negative electrode becomes negatively charged rich with electrons and the positive electrode becomes positively charged, lacking electrons. That means that the positive copper ions start to be attracted towards the negative electrode.
When one of those copper ions gets very close, what happens is that two of the electrons from the circuit jump out of the circuit and onto the iron. That means that they get rid of the 2 plus charge, which changes it into a copper atom. That makes the 2 plus charge disappear and the copper atom joins onto the outside of the electrode and makes the electrode that much larger. So the copper iron has gained two negative electrons and become a copper atom. But how are these two negative electrons replaced by the circuit? At the other electrode, uh, which is the positive anode, one of the copper atoms there gives away two of its electrons back into the circuit which then allows that copper atom to dissolve. It dissolves as a copper ion, effectively replacing the one which is just deposited on the negative cathode. The two electrons which are left behind then are pumped around by the circuit to replace those which have been used up at the negative electrode. So over a period of time this positive anode will dissolve into the solution and the positive uh, ions, the copper ions which have been released into solution will deposit on the negative electrode which gets bigger. Any impurities such as these little black atoms here will over a period of time drop to the bottom of the electrolyte and will form a sludge underneath the anode. So there are two half equations as they're called, one which occurs at the cathode and the other which occurs at the anode. Now remember the cathode is the negative electrode and the anode is the positive one. At the cathode, copper ions from the solution combine with two electrons from the circuit to form copper atoms. Whereas at the anode, copper atoms from that impure copper electrode each lose two electrons to form copper ions which go into solution. Now, two key words which apply to chemistry, oxidation and reduction. Oxidation is where something loses electrons and in this case oxidation is happening at the anode. Here the copper atoms are losing electrons and oxidation is lost. So this one describes oxidation. At the cathode what's happening here is that the copper ions are gaining electrons from the circuit so the copper ions are said to be reduced because reduction is gain of electrons so here reduction is happening there's an easy way to remember which way round these are we use this oil rig. Oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. In the next part of the specification we have to know about some alloys. Now alloys are mixtures which contain at least one metal, often more than one, and there are three that we need to know about which are amalgam, brass and solder. We also need to know a little about some smart alloys. This stuff on alloys is largely straight learning. There are three then that we need to know about. The first one is amalgam or dental amalgam. This is the stuff that our fillings might be made out of, although these days we tend to have uh, cosmetic white fillings. But those traditional silvery fillings are made of a mixture of mercury and silver. And the great thing about this uh, particular alloy is that it's liquidy when it's first made but it sets to a very 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 hard alloy in the mouth. Brass is a mixture of copper and zinc when it's alloyed together. Brass is very hard and it's sonorous so it's used for cymbals and uh, other musical instruments. 
Uh, it's used for hinges, ship screws, um, various other things. And solder is used for electrical joins. It's a mixture of lead and tin, um, but it's got a very good adhesive properties and conducts electricity, so it's used for uh, putting things onto circuit boards. Not only are alloys mixtures of metals with uh, other substances, but uh, also they are better than either of the metals which go up to make them. So for example, dental amalgam is soft when it's first made, but it sets very hard, um, and it's made out of two metals which are very different. Uh, mercury, which is a liquid metal, totally unsuitable for making um, fillings from and also very poisonous, whereas silver is too soft for the task, but when they're mixed together they make an alloy which has got better properties than either. Similarly, solder has got um, two metals in it, lead which melts at 327 degrees and tin at 232 degrees, but when mixed together it makes solder an, an alloy which has a melting point lower than either of them. So these alloys have got superlative properties, they've got better properties than uh, either of the substances which go up to make them. Another type of alloy, a new type, is called a smart alloy. Many of these have got shape memory and for that reason uh, some are used, for example, in stents. These stents are um, used for surgery. They're injected through a small tube into an artery near the heart and then they return to their normal shape which is expanded like this and they hold that blood vessel open to prevent further heart attacks and so on. Also used in spectacle frames, high-end spectacle frames, um, they can be bent around in all sorts of uh, directions and will um, return to their original shape again. Braces here contain shape memory alloys because they will try to, over a period of time, stretch back to their original shape. Other alloys will change back to their original shape when they're heated or cooled. So this magic teaspoon, for example, will appear to go all floppy when it's in a hot drink, but uh, will return to its normal shape when it cools down.